Hey, welcome, Serge. Uh, welcome to the show, Crazy Wisdom. It's great to have you here. Um, can you All right. introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So my name is uh, Serge Faget. I am a technology entrepreneur. I've uh, started a couple of companies from the e-commerce space to mobile to video communication. And I've been working around Silicon Valley over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, before that, worked at Google, went to Stanford Business School and Cornell. Uh, I'm originally Russian, but kind of grew up in the UK and in uh, the US. Cool. So that's a really short overview of me in a nutshell. Nice. Uh, so the reason I got in touch with you is because you've written quite a few blog posts about uh, your experiences with biohacking. Um, and it's something I'm really interested in, particularly this personalized medicine aspect of it. Um, what is your definition of stress and how do you work with it in your daily life? So um, I think it's really important to talk about uh, kind of like different kinds uh, of uh, stress. Uh, there's kind of good stress, which is just like intense pressure to get something done that you're excited about and that you're enjoying. And if that feels kind of stressful in the sense that after you're done with it, you're feeling like, ah, oh, I need to relax, mm. but it feels good. It's a thing that um, drives me to perform and to be creative and to come up with interesting solutions to uh, the challenges that I'm facing. Mm. And then there's um, the kind of low grade, annoying stress, uh, which is mostly inside people's heads and which is mostly not that useful, that actually detracts from your ability to work and from your ability to be creative. And I think that that is mostly about just um, things that are, when you start thinking about either the past or the future and things that what happened in the past that you should have done differently or that you regret or things that, you know, uh, there are going to happen in the future that you anticipate and that you dread or that you're nervous about. And I think that it's those things, the thinking about the past and the future, that uh, mostly generate stress that is counterproductive. And uh, we, uh, I think one of the best things you can learn to improve your productivity and creativity is just to learn to control uh, those things and to know that when to notice that stress arises and to bring yourself back to the present moment, which is, um, you know, one of the most fascinating things I think I've learned from meditation and from uh, psychedelics and a lot of other stuff is that uh, the present moment doesn't really carry negative emotions and doesn't really carry stress. There's very little that we're stressed about if we're focused on, you know, how the wind feels in our face or uh, something of that kind. Where and almost all of our negative emotions are about the past or or about the future. So I think to me, stress to a great extent is this um, mind. Um, game is, are these mind games that we're playing with ourselves mm -hmm. and that are counterproductive because if you think about it, uh, it doesn't maybe like you need to analyze a situation that happened in the past or plan for a situation that's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. But I imagine that um, you need to do that for maybe 5% of the time that you actually uh, do that. And um, uh, so it would be much more productive to stay in the present and to uh, truly relax or to do some useful productive work and to get away uh, from that. Yeah, it sounds like what you're saying is that the, it's the repetitive kind of stuck in a loop thinking about what happened in the past or thinking about what will happen in the future is the issue, the main issue. And you, if you really become more aware of your own thought processes and you can kind of cut those out before they start to go into this kind of um, loop, essentially. That's what you're talking about. And so how long have you been meditating? I have meditated for about five years okay. in one shape or another and seriously for, for about one and a half to, uh, to two years. And then in that, in your history of biohacking, uh, at what point uh, did you start biohacking, I guess? It was also about five years ago. I mean, in different shapes or forms, maybe like a small amount of things 10 years ago. And um, then it kind of 
grew over time and it became very active over the last two, three years. And so what do you think has been the main effect on your own mental health? Has it been the biohacking itself and all of these kind of getting into these biomarkers or has it been this kind of overarching meta uh, cognition that you've been able to enhance through meditation? Oh, I think that, well, first of all, it's kind of hard to unwind cause and effect because when we do things, the world is complicated, our bodies are complicated, and it's just hard to understand exactly what led to, uh, to what. Uh, but I think also all of these things are intertwined. So let's say you sleep very badly. You sleep just three hours a night on a consistent basis. It doesn't matter how much you meditate. You're going to be stressed, you're going to be unhealthy, and you're going to be unproductive. Similar to if you're really overweight and eating badly and not exercising, it doesn't actually matter. And similar if you have like thyroid hormone issues, you know, you're going to feel lethargic and unenergetic depend, no matter uh, how well you meditate, let's mm -hmm. say, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but then again, I, I think it's, re it's not enough to kind of sleep well and eat well. You should also be taking care of your own mental health. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a complex uh, of all the things that I have been doing. I'll, I'll point out the ones that I think had the most effect, although it is somewhat subjective. So I think it is definitely sleep. So it's uh, super important to sleep a lot and at consistent times. So I, uh, I definitely noticed when I went from sleeping six, six and a half hours to sleeping eight plus hours, it was a, quite a material difference. And actually, once you start tracking your sleep, so I use these like aura rings to track, um, uh, to track my sleep, you notice that you have been in bed for six hours, but you actually only slept for maybe five hours 10 minutes or five hours, 15 minutes. So it's, it's less. And um, I think when I just started sleeping more, I started procrastinating less um, and having fewer anger management issues and the like. Mm. I think certainly just like exercise and um, eating better has an impact. I think meditation has a significant impact, but it's a hard thing to learn. So I think one of the biggest challenges, it, it's such an impactful thing, but I just remember how hard it was at the beginning. Like I couldn't sit still for five minutes, mm. like in a still pose, because I would just be very fidgety and it would just be so weird and uncomfortable. And I didn't know what to do because it's so introspective. No one can really guide you to what is supposed to be happening inside your own mind. Um, I think that one of the things that um, has certainly had a significant impact on my happiness and stress levels are MDMA and um, LSD. Mm -hmm. uh, so these things, I think, when taken carefully and in the right setting and not as party drugs, but as things that you're supposed to uh, learn from and um, uh, be uh, used as useful tools, I think that uh, they have great uh, great potential. So uh, MDMA has significantly enhanced my ability to just connect with other people and empathize and um, uh, build better relationships. And I think LSD helped me uh, have a better understanding of myself and to have a better relationship with, um, with myself. And, and then there was... Mm -hmm. The last thing to mention is there were a couple of just medical things that uh, made uh, things better. For example, the biggest ones were probably when I uh, enhanced my thyroid hormones and uh, testosterone. So those things kind of add energy and better mm -hmm. mood and you might have an opportunity to do something around that. And when you were taking uh, LSD, was it a microdose or was it a full dose? I've done both. Okay. I found that um, full doses are more... Uh, certainly more valuable in terms of being calm and rested and unstressed. For some reason, I find that afterwards, for a couple weeks after some strong LSD trip, I'm in this super meditative state as if I'm meditating all the time. Mm -hmm. And also, when you kind of, when I see 
how my mind works and how what kind of things it can create and uh, the like, it becomes less important that someone caught me off in traffic. You know, mm-hmm. um, it it just uh, makes it, it's just like you notice all these really interesting, wonderful things about your own creativity and the complexity of your brain, and wow. uh, it becomes easier to dismiss things that are just not worth the time and effort. And um, so that's an interesting thing you bring up. And particularly, I'm interested in, because you seem like you're very evidence focused when you talk about biohacking. And have you gone into the evidence behind meditation at all? I've done a fair amount of um, just like general research. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't call myself someone who is um, amazing at doing reading of scientific papers. Although, like, I have um, a group of doctors that. Uh, do dig into it that in a more serious way it appears to be the case that there's a good amount of evidence Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, meditation although it's kind of a hard thing to research just because it's so individual like ultimately it talks about your own subjective experience inside Mm -hmm. your own consciousness and Mm -hmm. it's really hard to do like i don't know double blind placebo controlled studies of that how are you going to do that yeah how can you test whether somebody is in a meditative state or not like there's right uh, i don't know how to do that maybe brainwaves or something like that have you looked into brainwaves at all or any any like I haven't very much. I mean, I know that there's a lot of research, especially around meditation being done Mm -hmm. around kind of brain wave activity, but I don't know enough to talk about it in detail. And uh, this group of doctors that you work with, how did you find them? How did you kind of uh, uh, choose this doctor as opposed to another? Did you work with a service in order to find this group of doctors or did you do it on your own? No, I did most of it on my own. So... Uh, the way it happened is that once you start getting interested in things like health optimization and, you know, testing biomarkers and what are the optimal biomarkers to strive for, you start just like searching for that online and uh, you start seeing who writes high quality content related uh, to that, who talks about it in a high quality way. And then, uh, so, and then after kind of like see that you start hearing the same names over and over uh, again. And um, the way I found my doctor, Peter Atia is I've heard a number of uh, talks that he gave on the Tim Ferriss show, I think, mm. plus a number of articles that he wrote about things like uh, the biomechanics of heart disease and um, uh, the biomechanics of like ketogenic diets and things like that. Mm. And I just really liked, he's a guy who tests uh, a lot of things on himself. So he will, uh, you know, go get into ketosis and test mm. how well he performs on a um, bike ride with like an oxygen mask attached to track, track his uh, lung and cardio performance, things like that. So, and then, uh, so I just kind of explored this network of uh, people and it became apparent that some people really know what they're talking about or at the very least are doing a serious effort to to know and then through that network I just started looking for those people trying to have a conversation and as, as I learned myself uh, I become became more fluent in the topic so they became more interested in having a conversation mm-hmm. with me and then I evaluated a number of doctors And it would happen, what would happen is I would show up with, you know, 30 or 40 different questions Mm -hmm. that would be saying like things like, hey, you know, what do you think about brain electrostimulation or Uh some, or like, how do I optimize my sleep beyond A, B, C, D, E? And then we would just have a long conversation and that conversation would essentially also be an interview Mm -hmm. uh, in which I would understand uh, who they are and we would connect or not. Mm. Have you gotten into any kind of alternative treatments beyond meditation, for example, acupuncture or uh, massage or anything like that? I haven't really. Mm-hmm. Like I enjoy massage from time to time, but more just like as a relaxing um, activity mm-hmm. uh, after which my body feels better. Mm-hmm. So acupuncture, I don't know much about it and uh, it's on my list to mm-hmm. check out at some point. 
you're because well, as you're explaining that process, it sounds very similar to the process that I go through every time that I talk to a new person as a new body worker or a new acupuncturist. Uh, um, but it's interesting because I don't have evidence for all these different things that I'm talking about. But I mean, I have a lot of biomechanic evidence um, in terms of body work, but I don't have that much like specific testing, like actual objective measures on all these different things. Um, what, at what point do you think what you've done with your biohacking and, and medical um, interest, at what point do you think that will filter down, if at all, to the middle class? Oh, it's a complicated question because, mm. so there's one really large, there's a couple really large challenges mm. to it filtering down to the middle class. One is that we're all quite different as uh, human beings. And so these solutions, a lot of them, they don't really scale particularly well. So what's um, like, a, for example, a, um, our liver genome is very, very diverse. It's one of the most diverse regions of the human genome. And the reason for that is that, you know, if your tribe found a new mushroom and decided to eat it, you needed some of the tribe to survive. Mm. So, and um, uh, that is one of the reasons why people have such different effects from different medicines and why, you know, some people have acute side effects and some people have very beneficial uh, effects. So it's just challenging to do this complex um, personalized medicine without significant costs being incurred. I think that's one part. Mm -hmm. Another part is just like as a business proposition, it's not a very good one mm -hmm. because, um, you start doing this stuff and then like one person um, screws themselves up, up in some stupid way and then you get sued and like put out of business. So it's just like not a very attractive proposition. And I think that most of the people who become kind of like high-end concierge doctors, they're very cautious and they don't take on a huge number of people, etc. Mm -hmm. And then I think a large also problem is just that there's not a lot of demand, surprisingly, because so many people in the world, they only think about their body and think about um, medical issues once they have serious problems. Mm -hmm. So they don't think, of, and, and the problem is that like today's um, diseases that we face, so things like cancer and Alzheimer's and you know, heart disease, these are diseases that grow over decades. Uh -huh. So they grow actually over the person's entire uh, entire life mm. and by the time you feel symptoms you're kind of fucked mm -hmm. because um, by that time a large part of your body is um, you know the infrastructure itself is, is rotten and also so part of the challenge for doctors right is because mostly only really sick people go to the doctor so the doctors have a lot of incentive to, fo mm -hmm. to focus only on uh, fixing acute health problems rather than on health prevention so it's just like all of this systematic stuff, both the complexity of the human body and the legal system and uh, the fact that there's so much stuff that kind of like makes people more conformist mm -hmm. and uh, human psychology, a lot of these things come together to uh, prevent a large number of people in the general population from having these uh, technologies. And I'm not sure I have a good answer as to how, to, um, how that's going to change. And that kind of leads us into what I was really interested in. One of your blog posts uh, was about the way that technological advancement is about to change the way that inequality is going to happen and that uh, there's going to be a small sliver of population who's going to have access to things like what you're doing, also things like merging with certain technologies, for example, a neural brain neural, in, uh, um, uh, neural computer interface, uh, things like this. Uh, can you talk more about what your vision is for the way that this inequality is about to happen? Well, I think one of the things in today's world that still makes everyone equal is that everyone uh, dies and um, uh, that everyone's body deteriorates in certain ways, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think uh, it's very obvious that inequality is partially caused by various uh, feedback loops. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have, you earn money and you can spend that money on people to help you uh, 
be more focused and more productive and not do things like, I don't know, shopping or cleaning your uh, house. And then you have more time that you can then invest into uh, education. And then you have more knowledge and uh, capability that you then invest into making more money. Mm. So uh, I, I think a fundamental uh, reason for inequality are these various feedback loops where uh, that kind of like take uh, people upwards when they're on an upwards trajectory. And obviously there's other things like the fact that people um, who are wealthy have access to investment managers that help them multiply their wealth, etc. cetera. Uh, but I think ultimately if uh, wealth allows you to modify your own body and mind to get more energy on an everyday basis, to get uh, far more years of health, to get um, you know, moreover to start getting cognitive enhancements and mm-hmm. to start getting uh, enhancements that allow you to become an upgraded human being, which, you know, it, it, it is going to happen at some point. Mm-hmm. So I think it's um, fascinating when people online in some of my articles start saying, oh, that's not going to happen to you. You're not going to get there. Well, the thing is, it doesn't really matter if I get there or not. Like someone's going to get there eventually because the technology is on a trajectory where our understanding of the human body and the human mind is uh, expanding very, very rapidly. And uh, people are going to want to uh, you know, extend their life and to make themselves feel healthier and to make themselves be smarter. And that's going to be a very powerful mm. further feedback loop mm-hmm. because today also, like people grow wealthier as they grow older, mm. right? And older people might not have as much energy, as much desire to earn more wealth, etc. despite the fact that they have the knowledge and the relationships and the experience and the wealth that they've accumulated over the course of their lives. And if people can just control that, like a switch, and uh, turn it uh, up further and keep uh, kind of like experiencing uh, those benefits and continue doing that throughout their life, uh, that's going to be a very significant source of inequality. Plus, the complexity of these technologies means that there's always going to be a cutting edge So someone who uh, kind of like develops the most cutting edge technology in terms of neurocomputing or in terms of uh, other things uh, like that. And people who are wealthy are always going to have more access to the cutting edge that hasn't yet been mass marketed just Mm -hmm. because, you know, when something is made in small quantities and it's a prototype, it's much more expensive. And if those things grant you advantage in uh, you know, being able to make decisions, which certainly having good energy and having uh, better cognitive ability and the like does, uh, then you're going to be able to compound your uh, your wealth and reinvest that into more uh, into more biotechnology mm-hmm. and um, self enhancement. So, plus in the end, I think at some point. Um, so especially once we start going towards the whole brain computer interface story and merging with machines, et cetera, you're essentially saying, Hey, there's a data center that you can connect to your mind in order to expand your cognitive abilities and allow yourself to do more Mm. things. And a data center is obviously expensive. Mm. And, um, uh, so people who are able to dedicate vast wealth to, uh, enhancing their own brain power are just going to have an advantage. It's just going to be kind of an arms race around that. Mm. So I think my general thoughts kind of like go in this direction. I'm not sure, obviously nobody knows exactly what's going to happen, but it seems un- it seems extremely unlikely that people will not take advantage of these technologies in this way. And it seems extremely unlikely that they will not provide a significant competitive advantage to certain people. From that picture you just gave me, I got the understanding that it, in many ways in the past we had arm races between nation states. And from what, what, it, what you just said, it makes me think that we'll have, maybe not arms, arms races might not be the best way to say it, but we'll have individual consciousnesses, individuals that will uh, have access to the latest thing and it'll be basically like large accumulations of wealth under one person's 
uh, guys will then basically fight each other for, or compete with each other for um, better health, uh, more technology, things like that. Um, it is all kind of uh, difficult for me to uh, kind of envision. But it's really, it's really hard to envision exactly how it's going to play out because it's so different mm. from our world of today. I mean, I think that's the whole reason they call it the singularity, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's a horizon beyond which it's mm -hmm. really hard uh, for us to see uh, today. So, but there could be lots of scenarios like that playing out. Could could very well be that nation states will compete with each other for technology, technological enhancements of their populations, because mm -hmm. it's very obvious, for example, that, you know, using technology to uh, giving like, I don't understand why some place like China doesn't just give modafinil to all of its citizens, oh. um, you know, or uh, some kind of or some kind of tools that allow people to be more focused and uh, to be uh, more productive. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that that's going to happen at uh, some point. And I'm sure that things, for example, um, the obesity crisis in the United States, I, I think it's a very significant drain on the uh, national wealth because when you have, you know, I don't remember what it is, 30, 50, more than 50% of people I think are overweight. And obviously those people, uh, you know, have um, issues with their health that then the public pays for and issues with just being as productive and as energetic mm -hmm. just because it's a biochemical problem that uh, they have to struggle with so these things could become like uh, arms races between nation states as well it's really hard to figure out what exactly is going to happen there that's a really interesting thing that basically it's in the national interests of each country to have their population performing at a higher level but maybe that's not true because may maybe the way that we're going the way the technology is only going to enhance maybe one percent of the population's ability so then maybe they focus on that 1% as opposed to the rest of the population, which well, will become a declining tax revenue because they become less productive. Um, maybe. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to say, but, uh, but I um, think that governments are actually going to get more active in this whole uh, area just because there's a lot of potential returns uh -huh. on investments mm -hmm. in it. And uh, so what is the most interesting biotechnology that you've come across in the last month? Uh, um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that the most interesting uh, biotechnologies that are kind of out there and gradually happening today are what Neuralink and Kernel and other brain computer interface companies are doing. So mm -hmm. it's all very early stage, but I think that it's more advanced than people realize and it's going to uh, come to market with compelling applications faster than people realize. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the biggest expense that you've had in terms of, uh, uh, so you've, you've spent money on doctors, you've spent money on supplements, and you've spent money on testing. Which of those three represented the largest uh, uh, budget of your, of your um, testing? Or, mm -hmm. I think it's definitely the doctors, mm -hmm. really. So uh, because um, the um, supplements and meds are not that expensive. Mm -hmm. The testing, it is expensive in the United States, but most um, other places, it's not nearly as expensive. Mm -hmm. But it's the evaluation and the skill and mm -hmm. the uh, kind of expertise that's uh, quite narrow and very, very limited in the world. Because uh, there's a lot of wealthy people out there who are starting to understand that investing in health and health kind of optimization and uh, preemption of problems is something that is very worthwhile and uh, valuable. And mm -hmm. there's very few doctors who are compellingly, you know, um, experienced in this type of um, in this type of approach. Mm -hmm. So actually, one interesting analogy is just that doing a DNA test, like a complete sequencing of your genome. Today, like complete sequencing probably costs a thousand dollars. Twenty three and me probably costs I don't know, I remember a hundred or two hundred dollars. But if you want your DNA to be completely uh, deciphered, evaluated to do, with like all of the knowledge that exists out there, I think uh, the most recent estimate I've heard of that was like thirty to forty thousand dollars mm -hmm. to uh, to get an experienced person who's going to dig through the literature. Uh, etc., and c come up with some actionable 
uh, actionable things uh, for you. So it's really, it's really that that's most expensive because that stuff doesn't scale. Mm. Like it's uh, supplement production scales, test administration scales, but expertise on this like individualized medicine doesn't scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, reading through the literature, making making evidence based claims, and making strategies for their patient is a huge huge thing. Were and you- it's so hard. It's so hard because there's so much uh, contradictory stuff out there. There's like one paper that says, "Oh, antidepressants are bad for you." We did a meta review, and then you have to dig into it and look at their methodology and really understand that they have a sick cohort bias in order to um, in order to evaluate whether that strategy works or not so for example with my doctor when we uh, go over some decision to enhance uh, testosterone which is somewhat uh, of a controversial uh, practice uh, we look at um, I think I usually get a document with like references to 40 plus different papers where uh, and like five to ten pages of analysis as to why we decide to go this way uh, or another. And it's just hard. That stuff is dense. Mm-hmm. That stuff is dense. You have to understand biochemistry. You have to really understand statistics. You have to understand like how all of that knowledge comes about. Mm-hmm. It's hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and ha- have you, dis- have you tried to improve your ability to do that stuff or have you relied mostly on other doctors to kind of synthesize it? <clears throat> I, uh, I've done enough research that I have somewhat of a bullshit meter mm-hmm. so I kind of uh, understand when something sounds a little bit fishy mm-hmm. but I don't, I'm not nearly as good as my doctors and I mostly rely on them just because I understand that I will never be as much of an expert as they are and it feels like in the modern world it's important to focus on something in, in terms of at least like your almost professional expertise you, you should focus on some narrow domain that you can be truly exceptional at and um, leave other things to other professionals Mm -hmm. and how much were you able to like you're you're, you you speak russian you're able to go in russia and be uh, talk to doctors and stuff like that are any doctors in russia doing the same thing as the doctors in silicon valley or there are some people but i haven't really evaluated them as um, far as their competency is um, is concerned Mm-hmm. Okay, so it didn't make sense for you to maybe save a little bit of money and go go to Russia and, and try to figure it out. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, yeah, uh-huh. I, I haven't um, I haven't like seriously really dug into it too much because I wanted to go to some of the best people in the world because it's also it's also really important to have people who you can trust. And for me, when there are other Uh, highly sophisticated individuals who I respect, who trust uh, the same people who I trust, um, that to me is a strong uh, signal and helps my comfort with the team that I have. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I only have a couple more questions left, but one I'm pretty interested in from my own knowledge uh, is essentially in yoga and uh, kind of ancient sources, we talk about the unseen forces or unseen factors that affect our lives and a lot of yoga a lot of acupuncture a lot of these alternative medicines are about parsing through these unseen factors Uh, you rely a lot of these evidence on things that you can see for for sure Uh, do you have any understanding or belief that there are unseen factors that we are nowhere close to to kind of being able to decipher and kind of recognizing that those also have an effect at all uh, I think that our understanding of the body and especially the mind still has a lot, a lot of ways to go. Uh, and but that being said, I think I'm not really a believer in. Uh, the, I'm I'm a physicalist, so mm-hmm. I think that we have our you know standard model of particle physics, and it work, seems to work very very well. And, um, you know, we don't fully understand some of the things going on and things like that or or quantum mechanics, but we know that it works really well and it appears to describe uh, everything. So I almost like this argument that if, uh, you know, some people ask, do you think we have a soul? And I think that the answer is no, because um, the uh, standard model of particle physics essentially um, kind of like describes the behavior of the physical world to such a precise degree that 
uh, either there's nothing else there that um, we so we haven't noticed any anything else there that um, that um, is kind of beyond that measure of precision. So either the soul is something that doesn't exist, or it's something that is so weak and not noticeable that it doesn't matter anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh. yeah, it's 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 like I, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much a mm, materialist. I, yeah. yeah, materialist. I, th I think one thing that's quite possible, like, for example, meditation itself, it seems like that people over in a number of places in history have figured out something that's a good hack of the human mind of some kind. And they didn't know how to explain it, right? Um, but they did it. And uh, we are taking advantage of um, uh, their... Uh, their techniques in order to calm our own our own minds. So it's very possible that uh, people like um, acupuncturists, for example, have discovered something that for mm -hmm. some reason works, mm -hmm. and we don't yet know mm -hmm. why it works. And we might find out the exact mechanism through which it works. I just think that that mechanism is going to be something mm -hmm. that um, is, is just part of. Yeah, it's explainable in terms of uh, the laws of physics. Yeah, no, and that's actually why I, I found so much value from body work is because something happens in my body work in those sessions when I'm working with people who have discovered something that they that they have access to that that is not explainable or that we are just becoming a, uh, able to explain. I, I find value benefits that are almost as good as meditation, almost as good as all these other things that I've tried. Um, but that's, uh, that's really interesting. But I wanted to talk about one particular thing you said in terms of particle physics, because it applies to 99.9% .9 of all cases, unless we get to uh, a black hole or something like that. Um, and then those, those, those rules kind of fall away, right? Is that, is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, there are limitations to our understanding of the laws of physics, but these limitations ha happen very far outside of our... Uh, every day of the everyday experience of our bodies because we exist in a part of the physical world that's very low energy and low um, uh, yeah really a low energy part of the uh, the universe so I, I think the um, limits of the laws of physics that we've discovered are unlikely to apply to where our bodies exist mm -hmm. Great. That's really, uh, um, I've really enjoyed this interview. Uh, how can, uh, or I want to ask you what, one thing that you've come across in the last 30 days or so, one article, one book, one thing that you've found that could be really helpful to our listeners uh, for understanding how they can work with stress. Hmm. Let me think for a second. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually not sure. I, I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of books that um, I think have been helpful. Let me actually open up my sure. Kindle yeah. and I will try to give a suggestion. Ah, I just changed my phone and uh -huh. I don't yet have it, everything downloaded. So uh -huh. I'll, I'll drop you, I'll, I'll check and drop you a line through sure. uh, Facebook. Cool. Got that. And how can people find your writings and readings or more information on what you're talking about? Um, you can just uh, look on my medium slash hacker known blog, which is just um, medium.com slash Serge Faget, that's S-E-R-G-E-F-H-U-E-T. And if you just Google me, you're gonna find plenty of people discussing my articles. So yeah, uh, join in and you know I look forward to having hearing uh, comments and questions and I plan to write a lot more. Cool. Thank you so much, Serge, for coming on the show. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks very much. For having